<laughs> well, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 4 today, but before we get into that, please join me once again in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Your word is how you speak to us, and prayer is how we speak to you. Help us to be students of the word. Your word is your, your law, your statutes, your will. Help us to be more well-versed in it, experts in your word. Help us to measure and to weigh everything we think, say, and do through your word. And Lord, by your word, may you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, transform us into Christ-likeness. The good work that you've begun, you will complete on the day that you return or call us home. And that is a wonderful promise that we look forward to. As we're in your word today, and every time we're in your word, Lord, please bless us with understanding with understanding and then wisdom to actually do what we read and understand. Bless our time together in your word, for we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So we've been talking about the new covenant and how glorious it is and how wonderful it is and how great it is and that Paul is a minister of that new covenant. And that's what he's saying here. This is the light of the gospel. Um, foretold in the Old Testament, made manifest and completed in and through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And that's what Paul is talking about here. That the light that was foretold has been fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ. And this is the new and more glorious covenant that he is presenting. And this is a covenant that does not fade, will not fade. This is the, the end-all, be-all, perfect covenant. So here we go, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. Notice, it's not this ministry because I decided to do it. It wasn't something that he chose, God chose him. Having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. What ministry? The ministry of the more glorious gospel, the new covenant. This ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. What is he saying in those first two verses? He is saying this is the new and complete gospel, the new covenant, and it's so awesome and it's so glorious that we can't help but preach it boldly. And we're not going to tinker with it because it is the power of God. There's no need to tinker with it. There's no need to be pragmatic. There's no need to add your spin to it at all. Just boldly preach and proclaim it. This is the calling. And because of the glorious gospel that is unfading and unchanging, he has the heart and the wherewithal to face all difficulties that might come about by standing boldly on that gospel. Sometimes people lose heart and they stop. He's saying, I will not lose heart. We cannot lose heart. We do not lose heart because of the greatness of this ministry and calling and the greatness of the gospel and the one who fulfills it. How great a calling God has given us in Jesus. We cannot lose heart. We cannot. So this is the new covenant gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, we do not and we will not surrender it. We will not cower, cower away from it. We will not do anything to abandon it. We're going to stick to it. It does not need my machinations or my resourcefulness or anyone else's who came after, or before me or who will come after me. It does not need any of that. And when you, when you give the gospel, you will face attack. And what he's saying is, is that we're, no matter what happens, we're not abandoning it. This is it. It is so glorious and it's so great. You can't abandon it. There's nothing else coming. This is it. And it's the greatest. And it will never change. And so we're not going to abandon it. We're not going to be a, a faint-hearted coward. This is the idea here uh, of losing heart is not just cowardice. The idea here is that bad behavior as well. It's cowardly, bad behavior, bad conduct. To lose heart is to not only be cowardly in proclaiming the truth, but to turn against the truth. 
And he's saying we will not and do not do that. We do not do that. You either speak God's word or hold your tongue. If you're going to call yourself a preacher or a teacher of God's word, you speak his word or you hold your tongue. You either abide by what his word says or stop calling yourself a Christian. Speak as one who has been given a message from God. And this is a message that is not just for me, it's for all. It's for all. Paul preached his gospel, this gospel, the only gospel there is, humbly. He understood the glorious calling of this covenant was something that he could not choose. It was something God chose him to do. Not because of his own work, but he says here, I have received, we have received mercy. That's why mercy is, is undeserved. His call, he's saying the calling that I have received, that we have received to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the new covenant, is only given to me by mercy. He's not saying, I, Paul, am so much smarter than you. I know so much more than you. I deserve that. No. So humbly, it's just by mercy. By mercy. And he says something really interesting that, that, that needs to be heard loud and clear today. We've renounced the, the hidden things. We've renounced the, the hidden things. We've renounced shameful things. Not walking in craftiness, pragmatism, not handling the word of God deceitfully. What's he saying there? He's saying we've just preached the gospel honestly and straightforward and that's, that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we're observing the text by reading it. We're interpreting the text, rightly handling it, and then we're applying the text into our everyday life. That's it. I've literally heard nationally known pastors say, that's cheating. Come again? It's cheating. It's cheating to just exposit God's word and just go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's cheating. That's easy. That's what you're supposed to do. I'm glad you think it's easy. Then do it. But that's what you're supposed to do. You are not supposed to add things to it, subtract things from it, craftily find a way that, well, you know, people don't like it when I preach God's word this way, when I just exposit it and explain it and interpret it rightly and then apply it to everyday lives. People don't like that. So I'll bring in an elephant and I'll bring in a show and I'll bring in this and that and I'll tell funny stories and I'll do all this stuff. No. Do not dilute God's gospel. Don't do that. Don't adulterate it. You don't need to. It's the greatest waste of time to say that what God says to tell others, I need to adapt and change. I, I need to figure out how. I mean, God did his best. Bless his heart, as they would say in the South, right? Oh, bless his heart. He did his best. But people just aren't interested in his word and in his gospel, so I've got to add something to it. How shameful to say that. To say that is to besmirch God. Don't dilute the gospel. Don't adulterate it. Don't conceal it. He, that's what he's renouncing here. Don't corrupt it. Don't change it. Don't leave anything out. Don't corrupt it. Don't add anything to it. Don't mix the message. Don't add human ingenuity to it. It doesn't need to be there. Don't water it down. Don't accommodate to the audience. Just preach it as it's put down. That's it. And that's what he's saying I'm doing. And don't forget, he's also, as he's saying this, this is teaching how you should preach and teach, but it's also showing, hey, this is the difference between me, Paul, a genuine preacher of God's word, and those false teachers that are trying to get you to not listen. Huge difference. Huge difference. He didn't mix the message of the gospel with human ingenuity or water it down. He just preached an honest, simple, straightforward gospel. That's all he did. That's rare nowadays. Very rare. Many preachers fall on this exact point. They add to God's word things of human wisdom and human ingenuity, pragmatism, practical things that they think they can do and add to it to make it more impactful. But I and no one else are responsible for the impact of God's word. You preach it, right? And you teach it, rightly handling it, and that is to get it into people's ears, right? That's my job. 
That's every preacher's job. You preach it, you handle it rightly, it goes into people's ears, right? That's where your job ends because I can't take it from your ears to your heart. That's God's job. And lower the lights. Hey, will you play some, some soft piano music? Will you do this and that? No need. No need. You know? We don't have a fog machine for a reason. You don't need it. What's the point? It doesn't do anything. You don't, you don't need any of that stuff. You just need God's word. That's why God's, and his power is in his word, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. That's where the power's at. It's in his word and it's carried along by his spirit. That's where the power's at. And so when you do what Paul's doing, you are trusting in God, in his power, and in what his word says about his word. So you don't need to dilute things but people do that. They think that adding to the gospel will make it more effective or give it a greater hearing. But that is not true. Paul is saying, I will never do that. I will never do that. Because that is to handle the word of God deceitfully. Some people think you must adapt the truth to advance to the age. Which means that you must, you must take whatever truth there is and you need to mold it and shape it and change it so it meets today's culture. But that's not how it works. God, God is unchanging, and his word is unchanging. It is to be bent to, not bent for culture. Culture bends to God and his word, not the other way around. That wouldn't make any sense. And that's why, guess what? The truth is offensive today as it was offensive a thousand years ago. The truth is offensive. Christ is offensive. To hear that you're a sinner and in need of a savior is offensive. You're never going to change that. That's the truth. But that truth is what people need to hear. You're a sinner. You're in danger. This is an eternal problem. You need to deal with this. You're not at peace with God. What are you going to do? Well, I'll, I'll get to peace with God. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to live a better life. I'm going to do what I can. Well, God says you can't do enough. It's impossible to do it that way. Oh, well, now what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to do the only path that God has put forth, which is Jesus Christ. He knew we couldn't do it. By his grace, his unmerited favor, and his mercy, he has put forth a path for us to take. And that path is a simple one. It's one of faith and trust in Jesus Christ, believing in him and believing in him and his work on our behalf. Just trust and belief in him. That's faith. That's what faith is. Trust and belief in what God says. And that's what we do. We just teach that. You don't have to muddy it up with all this other stuff. So that's what Paul does. He preaches an openly true gospel. Anybody can look at what Paul preaches and see this, the plain truth of it. The plain, plain truth of it. No elaborate system. No hidden techniques. No for, you know, but wait, there's more. For an extra $5.99, I will tell you the other way. None of that. No hidden mysteries. No add-ons, no fine print. It's just simple. He has a, a gospel of integrity. Plus, I'll tell you this much. I'm not very smart. But I know that if I just do what God's word says when it comes to preaching and teaching, that it will have an effect. Not because of anything I do, but because I'm doing what he says he will do. And because of that, I know that it will be effective. I know, not because I'm so great or, oh, you know, his tonal inflections are just wonderful, you know, any of that stuff. No, I know it'll be effective because I'm doing what God's word says. And so he promises that his word will go out and not return void. I know it will be effective when you just follow God's word. And so that's what Paul does. Some men were attacking Paul with words. Some were attacking him with actions. But he knew that his ministry of this gospel would be found in approval of God and man. He had a clean, good conscience. Clean and good conscience in the sight of God. And that's what matters most. I love you guys. But if you had a, a wrong view of me, I'm going to be perfectly fine. Because you know what I'm going to consider is I only care about how God sees me. It's in the sight of God that matters most. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's preaching this gospel of God before God. He doesn't care what the false teachers are saying as far as it's not going to affect the way he does things. He cares that they're lying. He cares that it's harming the church. 
but it's not going to affect the way he feels or thinks about himself. It's far more important to know that what you're doing is right in the sight of God, and Paul had that assurance. He had a clean conscience. And there's, a, there's, a, there's no higher scrutiny than God's scrutiny. So if you're doing it right by the scrutiny of God, guess what? You're okay everywhere else. You're okay everywhere else. It's easy for Paul's enemies to claim he suffers so much because God is punishing him. Do you see how wicked? See how wicked you be? Wait, 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 that's not true. Paul's suffering because he's being true to the gospel. He's not suffering because God's punishing him, but that's what false teachers do. Oh, did you see how Paul's suffering? Obviously, God doesn't approve of his message. See how crafty that is? Oh, bleh. Doesn't it just make you mad? It makes your blood boil when you know something's just a clear and obvious lie? Verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So I want you to understand something there. The light of the gospel is the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That is spoken of as a, a sure thing. That is truth. That is an assured thing. But Paul is saying here that there is, what, if, the, if the gospel is so glorious, if this new covenant of this gospel is so glorious as you say, Paul, why don't more people like it? Why don't people run towards it? Why, why don't more people respond to such a glorious gospel? This is the answer. Because it's veiled. It's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, who is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the truth that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The false teachers are accusing Paul of not teaching a good message and that he's not teaching, not only is he not teaching a good message, but you shouldn't listen to him at all because look at the suffering he goes through. Therefore, he's not truly a messenger of God, which is easily countered by saying, did not Christ suffer? Okay, there goes that argument. Paul is saying, the problem is not the gospel. The problem is not the one who brings the true gospel. The problem is the hearers. The hearers. Again, you can preach the gospel. You can give the gospel. You, as lay people, you can share the gospel with those God has put around you, and you should. Matter of fact, you're commanded to do that. So be obedient and do that. And you might only get an, an opportunity to do that here and there. Or it might only be half an opportunity. Take what you are given, but do it. And he says that you can't persuade someone to believe. Only God can do that. Can you regenerate someone? Can you open ears and eyes and hearts? No. God doesn't tell you to do that. What's he tell you to do? Share the gospel. <laughs> Share the gospel. The Great Commission. That's what he commanded you to do. He's the one who opens eyes and ears and hearts. He's the one who allows people to see. Only God can do that. If people do not respond to the glorious gospel, it's not Paul's fault. It's not the gospel's fault. It's those who are perishing that miss the message. It's the blindness of unbelievers. And if an unbeliever is, is very blind, it does not mean that the gospel is unclear. The gospel is, is still as resplendent as ever, even if someone misses its light, right? God is still God and glorious and magnificent and holy, 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 even if you don't believe in him. doesn't change the fact that he is magnificent and splendiferous and holy, holy, holy. The God of this age has blinded them. That's Satan, the God of this world, the God of this culture, the God of the worldly system that we live in. Everything that this world, its, its desires, its hopes, its dreams, the way it's operating, that's all under satanic control. It's the culture of the world. It's the worldly way. And Satan has blinded people to God's truth. But this is not something that's done outside of God's power. Lest you think that Satan's more powerful than God, this is something that's being done within God's command, God's scope, 
God passively and actively carries out his will, always. He is sovereign and sovereign indeed. God allows such blindness and God cures such blindness. So knowing that, you now know how to pray for your lost friends, family, and loved ones. They're spiritually blind. You need to pray that the only person who can undo that spiritual blindness is God. So that's who you go to. Say, God, please undo that spiritual blindness. Help them to see. Regenerate them. Please save them. Only you can save them. They have no hope, just like I have no hope without you. This is all done in and through Jesus Christ, the new covenant. He is the image of God. You want to know what God the Father is like? Look at Jesus Christ. He is the perfect representation of God the Father. He is the image of God. You look to Christ and you see God the Father. You look at God the Father, you see Christ. They are one. They are one. I want you to know that the people who, who are blinded, the unbelievers, they're not innocent. They're not innocent. They're not innocent victims of Satan's work. Lest you think that, because that's wrong. Satan's work upon them is not the only reason that they're blind. If you bother to read a little further from John 3.16, you run into John 3.19, which says, This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Mankind can't sit there on judgment day and point at Satan and say, It's all his fault. Mankind is going to have their finger turned and it's going to point right at themselves and your own sinful nature because all are fallen. No one is righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Men love darkness. Men choose darkness. Satan, Satan still works hard to keep men and, and women blinded to the glorious light of the gospel. But no one is beyond God's opening of their eyes. God can unblind anyone. It's the minds, by the way, of the unbelieving ones that are blinded. Their mind is blinded. Satan works on the heart. He works on the emotions. But he works chiefly in the mind. You ever hear somebody say, that was a mindless action. You can work in the mind to make it think something wrong, or you can work in the mind to make it think less, which makes you mind less. Satan can work in either way. All he's doing is fanning the flames that you yourself already had there. There's a sense in which Satan rules the world, but God is still in control. God is still sovereign. Satan is not the ruler of this world in an ultimate sense, just in the sense that right now the world is underneath his dominion and is following his ways. But the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The, those who dwell within it are all the Lord's. You could kind of think of it like this. Uh, Satan is the, is the popularly elected ruler of this age. That's kind of saying something, isn't it? If you had Jesus and you had Satan and it was a political contest, the people of this world would choose Satan right now. Popularity vote, it would be Satan, not Jesus. And that's why the world is the way the world is. And that's why you can kind of say that, that Satan is the ruler of this world in a sense. All the while knowing that there's nothing more true than God is sovereign over all. And Satan is God's devil. The biblical truth is that Satan is the god of this age, but he's not a god. He's a little lowercase, right? Don't promote him to a position that's not his. I've said this many times. It's not, it's not Satan uh, versus Jesus or Satan versus God, and it's a big a galactic battle, and it's 49 to 49, and Satan slips on a banana peel, and Jesus gets a lucky uppercut, and oh, he wins by one point, or he wins by two points. Oh, whew, that was close. No, 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 no. 100 to zero. 100 to zero. Satan is a created being. God is the creator, the uncreated one. None of his creatures pose any more threat to him than a piece of paper you know, threatens you. There, there's no threat there. 
No threat there. They are not equal opponents. Satan, Satan is just full of false doctrine. He's not co-equal in power with God. He's not the opposite of God. Don't, don't give him more than he's due. But be wary of him. Because he prowls around like a lion looking for those he might devour. The devil is called the God of this age in no other way than Baal was called the God of those who worshipped uh, the God of Egypt. So Satan can only blind those who don't believe. He, he can't blind believers. He can't, can't undo what God has done. All this is lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ should shine on them. Satan directs his energies into blinding men from ever seeing the light of the gospel. But if God wishes to save someone, is God going to make sure that they see the light of that gospel? Yes, obviously. Obviously. That's, God, that's who God is. He is light. He is, he is the author of light. He is light. His word is light. Satan's the opposite of that. Darkness. Empty, nothing. Verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. You ever go to a sermon and you hear more about the pastor than you hear about Christ or about the word? Get out. Run. Run. We proclaim not ourselves. Well, you're not here to hear about me. You're here to hear about Christ. This isn't Michael's church. This is Christ's church. So what we proclaim is not ourselves. It's not, something we procl it's not something we made up, and we're not talking about ourselves. We're talking about Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. Oh, there's the right attitude. Wait, you mean to tell me the pastor is the servant of all? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's not the one who's supposed to. I saw a video recently somebody sent me of this uh, self-proclaimed pastor slash apostle. Okay, no such thing. And he, but he's been welcomed to their church for the first time, and they literally rolled out a red carpet and had people there cheering and, hey, oh, hey, oh, as he's walking down, right? Throwing pedals and, I mean, crazy, crazy. Save that adulation and that worship for Christ, please. We're just servants. We're just under shepherds of the great shepherd. We're your servants for Christ Jesus' sake, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Paul's not preaching himself. He doesn't get behind a pulpit every time he goes to speak and preach himself. He's not the focus at all. Who's the focus? Jesus. Jesus is the focus. So, all these false teachers can say, oh, Paul is all in it for himself. But what does the fruit tell you? You can tell if a pastor's in it, in it for himself or not, can't you? Pretty easily. If your eyes are open, you can tell pretty quick. So anybody who really knows Paul would be able to tell he, he certainly is not doing it for himself. He doesn't see himself as someone to be worshipped or adulated. He sees himself as somebody who is just a servant, your servant, for the sake of Christ. Humble, humble, humble. Jesus is the focus. So Paul can say without any hesitation, we do not preach ourselves. We don't preach ourselves. Jesus Christ is the one to preach about. Not everyone, this is sad, but this is true. Not everyone who opens a Bible and starts talking is preaching about Jesus Christ. You, you, you have to be wary. The good Bereans in Acts 17 were called good Bereans because they took everything that they heard and they compared it to Scripture. Even when Paul was talking to them, they go, okay, Paul. And then afterwards, what do they do? They go to Scripture to make sure that what, even what Paul was saying was found in Scripture. That's what you do. The focus must always be on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He's the one to preach about. The focus on touching life stories or experiences or funny stories. Um, maybe they have a place here and there, right? But that shouldn't be the overarching focus. Sometimes people love it when a preacher preaches about himself because it feels revealing, right? Like, ooh, I get to learn a little bit about 
the pastor, ooh, this can be entertaining, right? But you want to be careful because you don't want a preacher to say, boy, they really, boy, they really woke up and they were really attentive when I was telling them about how, you know, in the middle of the night last night, Tiffany throws her arm over my face and, you know, pulls her hand across me to make sure it was really me in the bed and not some stranger. And people love that. And you might say, well, I really got a good response from that. I didn't get nearly the response when I was just expositing scripture, so therefore, I should tell more stories, right? Preachers must be aware of that. The bottom line is that the preacher himself can't, can't bring you to God and save your soul. Only Jesus can do that. What a preacher does is share the word of God with you. Get it into your ears. It's God who takes that message from your ears and brings it to your heart. It's all a matter of proportion. I like a good stapler joke just like all you do. But I don't, it's not proportionally, right? Very, very small percentage of stapler jokes compared to scripture and exposition. It's kind of like soup. Somebody comes up to you, have you ever eaten out at a restaurant, a waiter brings a soup, and they, would you like some salt in your soup? You'd be like, well, yes. And then they pour a whole ladle of salt in your soup. You go, oh, 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 that's too much, right? It's a matter, it's a matter of, of proportion, right? I just want a little bit of salt, right? Just a little bit of, of life story, just a little bit of this, just a little bit. It's a matter of proportion because I have a much greater message than myself. The much greater message is the message that God has already breathed out, all of Scripture. So it's not only that Paul did not preach himself, he also did not preach a gospel of moral reform or a gospel of rules. He preaches a gospel of grace in and through Jesus Christ the Lord. The, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, by faith alone, through grace alone, and Jesus Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, all through Scripture alone. That's what he does. That's, that's his goal, is to bring men and women to Jesus. That's it. I'm going to bring men and women to Jesus. I can't make you make changes in your life, but I can bring you to Jesus, and he will make changes in your life. You will be transformed by him, by God's Holy Spirit, not by me. Paul understands that. What's my job? My job is to bring people to Jesus. Tell them about Jesus, point them in the right direction, bring them there, and then my job is done at that point. Honest, sober, faithful preaching is powerful. Call it simple. I don't care because it's powerful. It's powerful. You can't, you, you can't, you can't, some people want to raise a tree and they don't care if any fruit comes or not. But if you bring people to Jesus and Jesus saves that person, there's a guaranteed fruit. Guaranteed. When a man is brought to recognize Jesus Christ as Lord, loves him, worships him and such, what, what more could you want? That's great. That's what you want. And Paul knows we ourselves are slaves for, your, for you, for Christ's sake. He doesn't present himself as a Lord. He doesn't have a list of demands for the green room like celebrities do. I need to have 16 bottles of Evian. I want the caps quarter turned on each one. I want all red Skittles. I want all these listed demands. That's not Paul. He's simply a servant for Jesus' sake. He is uh, humble, humble, always serving others for Jesus' sake. He's doing it to please who? Jesus. That's why he's doing it. He's not doing it to please man. He's doing it to please Jesus. He's doing it to please God. Then he says, the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. So Paul here is saying, the Lord God who created light in the physical world can create light in your spiritual darkness. The God who created light there can certainly create light inside of your dark heart, your dark soul. He can fill you with spiritual light. Do you know anybody else who can do that? Is there anybody else who made light? No. There's only one person, right? One person can save. That's God. One person can put light where darkness existed before. That's God. 
He can do that no matter what. Even if Satan wants to blind somebody, he can't overpower God. So God's work of bringing light is, is greater than all. And Paul's quoting Genesis 1-3 when God said, let there be light, and there was light. And Paul knows that God can do that in a believer's life. He can command physical light into existence. He can command spiritual light into existence. And, to, and what's that tell you on how to pray for those you love? Or maybe even for yourself. Lord, I am in darkness. Please bring your light. I can't, I can't go through this 12-step process or this 20-step process or I can't change enough habits in my life to bring me that light. Only you can create light. So who do you go to? The person who can create light. God. God alone. You must to find that light. Light is truth. Light is good. Light is life. To find that, then you must go to the only source there is of such light, who is, again, God. God. You can stare into your navel and not produce light. You can stare all you want. You can sit there and, oh, buy those fancy balls that, that you take a stick and wow, 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 wow. You can ring bells. You can do, you know, oh, I need crystals. I need all this different new age junk. Do it all to your blue in the face. You cannot create light. The answer is not within yourself. Because you know what's in your, within yourself? Darkness. The answer is outside of yourself, and it's in the source of light. And there's only one source of light, and it's the one who said in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. The one and only creator who can do that physically is the one and only creator who can do that spiritually in anyone. And he has shown that light in our hearts. That's what Paul's saying. He's talking about his own conversion there in Acts 9, his own conversion. God has shown his light in our hearts. He's talking from experience. God did that to me, Paul says. Me, murdering Paul, who killed Christians, who persecuted Christ and his bride. Me, God saved me. God brought light into that dark place, spiritually speaking. And if God can do that for Paul, he can do that for you. He can do that for you. On his way to Damascus to persecute and kill Christians, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Remember that? Light shone around him from heaven. This is the first encounter that Paul has with Jesus Christ. It's a good way to describe a Christian, somebody with light in their heart. You're, you were once one way, and now you're another. You once had a heart full of darkness, but now you have a light heart filled with light and that is reflective light it's not your own light right it's not it's not oh i'm so wonderful let me just shine my light on all of you no you know intrinsically even if even if you're not a theologian you understand that that light's not your own it's the light of god it's christ's light you're just reflecting it it's a good way of describing a christian what has God shown in our hearts? It's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, who is Jesus Christ. Even if you can't put it into words very well, every Christian has some knowledge of the glory of God, even if you words now good and you not good words. Even if you not good words, you know some glory of God. You have some knowledge of the glory of God. You have something. God gives us the light of the knowledge of him, and we have the responsibility to then share that light. We shine that light every time we tell others of Jesus Christ. When we share the gospel, you are shining that light, which glorifies God in Christ. I don't know who came up with this story, but I think it's a good one. Imagine a man in a sunny room who enjoys the sunshine so much that he wants to keep it all to himself. And so he says, I will shut the curtains so none of this light gets out. And he puts himself back in darkness. When we try to hoard up the light for ourselves, we lose it. That's the idea. Don't do that. Don't close the curtains. Because it won't have the desired effect. Don't be that fool. Instead, you keep those curtains wide open. We come to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ that's where we see God. 
That's where we see that light. That's where we see this glory. It's all through and in Christ. God gave us a picture, a representation of his glory, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. So you want to know what God the Father looks like? You want to know his attributes? You want to know what he's like? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, He who has seen me has seen the Father. He also prayed that we would see his glory, the glory of God the Father, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. You want to see God's glory? You look to Christ. And once you've seen that glory, your job then is to simply tell others of that glorious gospel that bears his name. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel that is not of works of our own. It is a gospel of faith in your work and your work alone, which faith in you and in what you've done is what saves us. And so that just makes me think of when Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's because Jesus took all the burden. He carries the weight of the yoke on his shoulders. And all we need to do is put faith in him and his work, and then we are justified, made right with God the Father through the actions of God the Son, brought forth in our lives through God the Spirit. God, what, what can we say but thank you and help us to live our lives for you? Be with us now and forever in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be part